Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a pleasure to see you here. My name is Ricardo Ruiz, and I'm, the, I'm a professor here at the LSE under the A.W. Phillips chair. It is a real delight to have as our guest tonight Lawrence Ball, or better known as Larry Ball, uh, who will be telling us about the Fed's influence on Lehman Brothers. I'm going to do a very short introduction because we're here to hear what Larry has to say rather than hear people talk about Larry. And so let me just tell you that Larry is the um, He's a professor of economics at Johns Hopkins University, where he's also currently the department head, uh, and where he's been for quite a long time, it's a little bit over 20 years, after having taught at NYU and Princeton before moving to Hopkins. Larry got his PhD from uh, MIT. Larry has, uh, over the years, done um, very groundbreaking research. He has seminal work on the foundations of New Keynesian economics, or that is, on the understanding of the effects that monetary policy has on inflation and the real economy, as well as very important work more recently, understanding um, why the effects of recessions on unemployment last for very long and what can monetary policy do about it, and in particular, to what extent monetary policy-induced recessions can lead to uh, persistence effects on unemployment. And he's also done quite a bit of work on fiscal policy he is an, and, and together with monetary policy, he's an advisor to a number of central banks, including the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England. Uh, over the years, he's advised them, and nowadays, I think, more actively to the IMF, where he's an advisor on monetary policy issues. With that ado, Larry's going to speak for the next 40 minutes or so, and then we'll um, turn it to the floor, and then I'll collect some questions, and we'll have some Q&A. So with no further ado, please welcome Larry Ball to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, and thank you to everybody who's come. I'm very glad to see everybody. With the first day of the semester, there must be some good parties, but I guess that doesn't start till later, so I ho hope this is an adequate warm-up. Um, uh, all right, so I I'm sure all of you know why we're here as far as there was a big financial, a terrible financial crisis uh, 10 years ago. It started in the United States, it spread around the world, it caused a terrible worldwide recession. Uh, I think the effects are still felt, and I think the whole world would have been a happier place over the last decade uh, if the financial crisis had been more muted. Um, and, I, and I think the financial crisis would have been more muted if Lehman Brothers had been rescued. Uh, now, Lehman Brothers was unique in that Again, as everybody knows, uh, there were lots of rescues, or the pejorative term people use is bailouts, uh, but many financial institutions got very close to failing and surely would have failed, except that the last minute, the Federal Reserve rode in and made emergency loans to keep them in business. So AIG is very famous, Bear Stearns is very famous, uh, there were others. Uh, Lehman Brothers was unique. It was the one big financial institution in the United States for which the Fed did not step in at the last minute. And on, in the early hours of September 15th, 2008, uh, 10 years and two weeks ago, uh, Lehman filed a Chapter 11 bankruptcy petition. Uh, and again, we, we can never know how history would have played out exactly if Lehman uh, had not failed. Uh, but I think it's likely the whole financial crisis and the whole Great Recession would have been uh, less severe. Now, of course, for the last 10 years and two weeks, there's been tremendous debate about why, uh, if the Fed rescued Bear Stearns, rescued AIG, why they did not rescue Lehman Brothers. Um, and people have advanced many theories, and I've listed some of them here. Many people say, oh, it's obvious it was all political. Um, uh, people, uh, Congress and the American public wouldn't stand for another bailout. So that's why Lehman wasn't rescued. There's a variation on the political story, uh, which is that uh, Lehman had to be sacrificed for the, the benefit of the rest of the financial system, that lots of institutions had to be failed. That wasn't possible politically until one institution failed, uh, and everybody saw how that terrible it was, uh, and that would politically allow for rescues of other institutions. That's another story. Uh, some people say there was a legitimate economic argument uh, for why the Fed didn't rescue Lehman, uh, and the buzzword is moral hazard, and the idea is that if the Fed keeps rescuing one institution after another, uh, that will give incentives 
uh, for banks to, to, to be overly risky, and um, uh, so, so letting Lehman fail uh, <coughs> was an effort to prevent moral hazard. Uh, and then finally, and of course these different explanations are not mutually exclusive, another factor that many people have suggested is that policymakers did not fully anticipate just how damaging the bankruptcy would be to the financial system and the world economy. Some people have speculated that if at the time uh, the Federal Reserve had known just how bad the effects of the Lehman failure had been, they might have made a different decision. So many people have suggested reasons, which on the face of them I think all are plausible, uh, about why the Fed did not rescue Lehman. Now, Federal Reserve officials, starting soon after the bankruptcy and continuing through this year, have many times been asked, why didn't you rescue Lehman Brothers? And they actually have given a very clear, consistent answer over the last 10 years. And their answer has nothing to do with any of these factors. So Ben Bernanke, Timothy Geithner, on down, different federal officials, they all insist that they knew in advance that the Lehman failure would be a catastrophic event for the economy. They, they were desperate for it not to happen. Um, uh, politics did not play any role in their decision. Uh, they were trying to do what was best for the economy. Um, uh, Bernanke and Geithner have also said they were not particularly trying to make a point about moral hazard. Uh, so why didn't they rescue Lehman? Well, they have a very concrete, specific explanation, which is that we, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and other Fed officials, uh, did not rescue Lehman Brothers because we did not have the authority to rescue Lehman Brothers. It, it would not have been legal for us uh, to give them a loan. Uh, why is that? Well, under the Federal Reserve Act, Section 13 of the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the, the Fed is allowed to lend to an investment bank like Lehman Brothers only if the bank can post satisfactory collateral. Satisfactory is the word in the Federal Reserve Act. That's a somewhat vague term. Uh, Fed officials have talked about what, how they interpret the term satisfactory. I have one quote here uh, from uh, one of the Fed's chief lawyers. Loosely speaking, satisfactory collateral means there's enough collateral so the Fed is sure uh, not to lose money uh, on the loan. Um, and repeatedly, again and again and again, uh, top Fed officials have said uh, Lehman did not have satisfactory collateral for the loan it needed to survive, and therefore it was illegal to lend to them. So I have a couple of quotations here. Ben Bernanke in 2009, their available collateral was well short of what they needed. Uh, Bernanke 2010 puts it very bluntly, um, the only way we could have rescued Lehman would have been to break the law, and we didn't want to break the law. Uh, this has continued in Bernanke's memoir in 2015. There are very similar statements. Uh, just this year, uh, Ben Bernanke has been making a series of appearances with uh, Tim Geithner and Henry Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, when Lehman failed. And they are making a number of media appearances, I think in an attempt to set down what's the official history of, of what happened in the financial crisis and why Lehman was allowed to fail. And again, they're, they're sticking to their story and saying uh, the same thing over and over again. Uh, however, of course, just the fact that something is said over and over and over again very emphatically uh, by very eminent people does not automatically mean that it's true. And um, the thesis of my book is that it's, is, it, it's not true. Um, so we can talk about what were the effects of Lehman's failure, which again, I think were quite dire for the, real, for, for the world economy. But uh, the central question in the book is not what are the effects of Lehman's failure, but uh, why did the Fed decide uh, to let Lehman fail? And um, after considerable research, I concluded uh, that the story about Lehman did not have enough collateral uh, and therefore was not legal to lend to them, that that is simply not true. And it is untrue in two related but distinct senses. Uh, the first is that if you actually look at the decision making, if you look at what Federal Reserve officials were saying to each other and what factors they were considering on the eve of Lehman's bankruptcy, they were considering various economic effects, various political effects, 
of what would happen if Lehman fails, what would happen if we rescue Lehman. The topics of was there enough collateral, do we have the legal authority, those issues did not come up before the bankruptcy. Uh, those ideas were developed after the bankruptcy as an explanation after the fact for why the Fed did what they did. So, um, so that was not the reason of time. Uh, secondly, it's possible today to do what the Fed did not actually do at the time, which is to ask the question, does Lehman have enough collateral for the loan that it needs? And um, I will give some details, obviously, in the talk, but what one finds is if, if you add up reasonable estimates of how much money Lehman needed to borrow to survive, and then you add up how much collateral was available that they could have posted against the loan, it's clear that they did have enough collateral. Uh, therefore, it would have been legal uh, for the Fed to lend to them. The Fed would not have been taking uh, on substantial risk for itself or for U.S. taxpayers because there was plenty of collateral. All right, now, maybe I sound a little bit opinionated. How, how do I know uh, this is true when Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner and so on say it's not true? Uh, so one thing that is not very well known, which I would like to publicize, is there was actually a tremendous amount of evidence, very hard evidence, on what happened in the Lehman Brothers episode, which is publicly available, and I think has not been studied enough, and my book uh, tries to rectify this. So the evidence comes from a number of sources, but, but there are two sources that are most important, uh, and they were official investigations by two bodies. Uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which was appointed by Congress, and a bankruptcy examiner appointed by the bankruptcy uh, court. Uh, these were huge tens of millions of dollars uh, investigations with dozens of lawyers and accountants and investigators. Um, they had subpoena power, so they were able to interview everybody relevant. Uh, they were able to gather all sorts of documents, including very internal, uh, very uh, detailed internal documents about Lehman's finances so that one can trace day by day how much money Lehman had, what was happening to it, what assets they had. Uh, they also have uh, many, many emails and memos uh, sent between uh, Federal Reserve officials and Lehman's, Lehman exec executives uh, right before the bankruptcy. Um, again, I think the existence of the, uh, these sources of evidence is not as well known as it should be. Many people have made reasonable speculation about, well, it must have been the Fed was thinking this, or this, must, this or that must have been the reason they acted. In many cases, you don't really need to speculate or use your judgment because you can just look at the emails. And it's actually that the Fed officials are sending to each other. And it's actually quite easy to literally do that. So both the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission um, and the uh, bankruptcy examiner have very user-friendly websites, and here are the web addresses. If I see anybody uh, looking at a cell phone, I will assume it's because you are going to these websites and uh, looking up some of the documents that I refer to. Or if you uh, don't have time during the lecture, I invite you to do that after the lecture. So um, I will give details in this talk of some of the evidence, uh, but it's a case in which that there really is enough very hard evidence uh, to make firm conclusions. All right, so what will I do in the rest of my remarks before, and I hope to have plenty of time uh, for questions and back and forth. Uh, well, first of all, as background, uh, a brief refresher on the crisis. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know a fair amount of this, but I'll go through a brief uh, review. Um, uh, then I will turn to uh, the central point of the book uh, about could the Fed have rescued Lehman and, and go through some of the evidence or summarize the evidence uh, showing that Lehman had plenty of collateral to borrow the amount of cash it needed to stay in business for a substantial period of time, um, and therefore it was legal and feasible for the Fed to rescue Lehman. Now there's another point, uh, which, which again I think is not appreciated by a lot of people. The, the Fed's failure to rescue Lehman was not simply a passive act. It was not just that Lehman got in trouble and the Fed stepped aside and allowed Lehman to fail when they could have rescued Lehman. 
the Fed actually intervened in the Lehman crisis in an affirmative way on the side of making sure that Lehman went bankrupt. Uh, so Fed officials on September 14th, the day before the bankruptcy filing, clearly instructed Lehman Brothers uh, to go bankrupt, uh, to file a bankruptcy petition. And then, as I'll discuss in a little bit of detail, they took some actions to make sure that Lehman was not able to raise enough funds to operate and had no good alternative to bankruptcy. Um, after that, the last part of the talk, I will talk about uh, the evidence and statements that we have about uh, the reasons for the Fed's actions. And I will draw a contrast between uh, the real-time evidence on what the Fed was thinking and doing in 2008 and the retrospective statements of Fed officials uh, over the last 10 years. Um, and um, as is often the case, um, uh, unfortunately, when government officials speak, what they say after the fact and the real-time record uh, don't always match up very well. Um, so the real-time record makes it clear that uh, politics was a central reason for uh, the Fed's decision to allow Lehman to fail. So this is not a new idea on my part. Many people have said, oh, it was all political, uh, but everything I've seen is very consistent with that. Um, uh, in addition, uh, the evidence suggests strongly uh, that Fed officials did not fully anticipate uh, the damage the Lehman bankruptcy would do. The retrospective statements, uh, again, the Fed has developed, uh, so Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, the Fed's lawyers, have repeatedly give, uh, given a very clear story about lack of collateral, lack of legal authority. Uh, those statements are what we call in the United States uh, alternative facts. Um, they are, they are, are simply not rooted in reality. All right. <clears throat> so uh, brief refresher, and I, I guess especially for those of you who might have been eight years old in 2008 and were not reading the FT as, as closely as you do today. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of 2008 on Wall Street, there were the big five investment banks. They're all famous. I list them there. They all had very similar crises. And this is one point which, again, is not appreciated by everybody, that there was really nothing special about Lehman Brothers, that all the big investment banks had essentially the same business model. They all had similar crises. What happened to them in the end was quite different, uh, but that was largely because of different reactions by the Federal Reserve and the government. Now, and again, with 10 years hindsight, I, I think it's pretty well understood uh, what the, the big investment banks did that got them in trouble. And, and, and there were three parts to the story. Uh, first of all, um, all of the big investment banks made big bets on real estate uh, during the real estate bubble in the United States. And when the bubble collapsed, those bets went sour and all five big investment banks lost money. That was factor number one. Uh, factor number two, and this is pretty well known, is that all of the investment banks were very leveraged. <clears throat> they had very low levels of equity uh, relative to their assets. <clears throat> so once they started losing money on their real estate investments, they didn't have to lose too much money uh, before their equity started getting close to zero and people in markets started to fear maybe the investment banks are becoming insolvent, uh, maybe, they won't, maybe they're not sustainable. And then finally, the, the really fatal problem uh, was that all the investment banks relied very heavily on short-term borrowing. So they funded large, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of illiquid assets through short-term borrowing from other financial institutions. A lot of it was overnight borrowing, which had to be rolled over day after day after day, and their whole business model depended on uh, their counterparties being willing to roll over short-term funding day after day after day. Once they lost money on real estate, once there were fears about the, the viability of the investment banks, they experienced essentially a 21st century version of a bank run. It, it wasn't people, it wasn't retail depositors lining up outside a bank to withdraw cash. Uh, in this case, they were getting their funds from other big financial institutions through overnight lending, uh, but they uh, cut off that lending, and so the, the proximate reason that Lehman declared bankruptcy on the morning of September 15th 
is that they didn't have any cash. They were due to make payments to counterparties on September 15th, and they just didn't have the cash to do it because their normal sources of cash had suddenly been cut off. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> How this played out over time. So the financial crisis in the U.S. flared up in March 2008 uh, with the Bear Stearns crisis. So Bear Stearns was the first of the big five investment banks to get in serious trouble. Uh, there was a run on Bear Stearns. Uh, its short-term funding was cut off in very much the same way that Lehman's funding was cut off six months later. What happened in that case is that Bear Stearns was rescued uh, through an acquisition by J.P. Morgan Chase. But crucially, before J.P. Morgan Chase uh, agreed to purchase Bear Stearns, they said Bear Stearns has to get rid of $30 billion of real estate assets that we think have questionable valuations. And the way Bear Stearns got rid of those assets was that the Fed uh, created an, uh, an entity, Maiden Lane LLC, which bought the assets from Bear Stearns that J.P. Morgan uh, uh, didn't want. Uh, and so the, the Fed's assistance in that way was crucial uh, to, to preventing uh, Bear Stearns from going bankrupt. Now, right after the Bear Stearns crisis, <clears throat> it occurred to Fed policymakers this kind of thing could happen to other investment banks. We want to guard against that. And in an effort to prevent similar runs or liquidity crises at other investment banks, uh, the Fed created something called the Primary Dealer Credit Facility, the PDCF, the purpose of which was to make short-term loans to investment banks if they got in trouble because their normal sources of funding dried up. And I'll come back to this because the most straightforward way that the Fed could have kept Lehman going in September would have been to be more generous in lending to Lehman through the primary dealer credit facility. And, and that didn't happen. All right, September was when uh, the crisis exploded with a number of dramatic things happening in quick order. Uh, on September 7th, uh, that was when uh, the U.S. government took over the giant mortgage agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the run on Lehman, the cutoff of funding, happened very suddenly, essentially over a course of three days. So bank runs can be very sudden, dramatic events. You know, everybody suddenly lines up in front of Northern Rock. Uh, similarly, very suddenly, uh, there was a collapse of confidence and Lehman's funding was not run over, uh, was not rolled over. So uh, September 12th was a Friday. At the end of Friday, September 12th, it was clear that there was no way Lehman could open for business on Monday, September 15th. It didn't have any cash. There was no way it could open unless either it was acquired by a stronger firm or the Federal Reserve stepped in uh, to provide cash to allow Lehman to operate. Now, um, there, were, um, th there were vigorous negotiations at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, trying to find a solution to this problem. And as of Saturday, September 13th, uh, everybody thought there was a tentative solution. So there was a tentative agreement that Barclays, the British bank, uh, would acquire uh, Lehman Brothers. Uh, and there were a number of condition terms, but uh, that was the deal. On Sunday, September 14th, uh, there was the shocking news to the people in New York uh, that uh, this was not approved by the UK's Financial Services Authority. So Barclays, of course, is a British bank. Uh, it needed approval from the Financial Services Authority, and they did not immediately give their approval. Uh, now, what exactly the Financial Services Authority did uh, to prevent the deal and whether they were justified and whether, with more time, the FSA's objections could have been uh, worked out uh, that's a subject of controversy, uh, perhaps this being a British audience, we can talk about that more when we get to the Q&A. But in any case, uh, for the purpose, from the point of view of the people in New York, uh, Britain's bank regulators said you can't, you, you can't uh, have this deal go through. Um, around the same time, uh, on the side, uh, Merrill Lynch was acquired by Bank of America. Um, so, uh, they easily could have gone bankrupt very quickly, but they, they found uh, a stronger firm to acquire them. 
Um, on Sunday, September 14th, uh, realizing that Lehman uh, had no cash and the Fed was not going to give them any cash and nobody was going to acquire them, they realized they had to file a bankruptcy petition. And there was a process of about six hours. Um, uh, Lehman's lawyer, uh, Lehman's lead bankruptcy lawyer has pointed out quite bitterly uh, that this was by far the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history and usually it takes a long time to plan bankruptcies. Uh, this was the shortest bankruptcy petition ever because they were given about six hours in which to prepare a bankruptcy petition. And a lot of the chaos uh, that ensued came from the extreme lack of planning and, and abruptness of the bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy filing. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lehman actually filed his bankruptcy petition at 1.45 a.m. That is 1.45 a.m. in New York which means, of course, 6.45 a.m. in London. So Lehman's London broker-dealer was supposed to open at 9 a.m. London time. The bankruptcy petition was filed at 6.45 a.m. London time, so there was not a lot of room to spare to put a lot of nuances into the bankruptcy filing before the petition had to be filed. Okay. All right, and then just very briefly, um, uh, the Lehman fi bankruptcy filing was the point at which the financial crisis exploded. Um, and I list some of the features of the financial crisis, a huge credit crunch, plummeting stock prices, uh, record lows in consumer confidence. A whole bunch of bad things happened in uh, the financial system and the economy, <clears throat> which led to, in the United States, by far the worst recession since the 1930s, and of course, the financial crisis and the recession spread throughout much of the world. Um, now, one detail uh, is that two of the big five investment banks survived. So again, uh, Bear Stearns was taken over by J.P. Morgan Chase. Merrill Lynch was taken over by Bank of America. Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. Uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley survived. But a key reason they survived is that the Fed was much more generous in lending them cash uh, than they were with Lehman Brothers. Um, so they borrowed tens of billions of dollars, and that allowed them, uh, allowed Goldman and Morgan Stanley to weather the crisis uh, after Lehman had declared bankruptcy. Um, all right, I think I'm doing pretty well with time, actually. <clears throat> all right, now let me at this point get right to the heart of the matter or uh, the main point of the whole book, uh, which is that would it, it would have been feasible and legal uh, for the Federal Reserve to provide loans or liquidity support, is the jargon people use, uh, to keep Lehman going, at least for a period of weeks and months, <clears throat> long enough to work out some kind of resolution of Lehman's crisis uh, that was better and less disruptive to the financial system uh, than telling Lehman Brothers you have six hours to prepare a bankruptcy petition for the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. All right, so, so again, the claim of Fed officials is it was not legal to lend to Lehman because the collateral they had available uh, was less than the amount of money they needed to borrow to stay in operation. Um, now, the book goes through this in great detail. I don't have time for all the details here, I in invite you to look at the book and look up my sources on the websites of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and the Bankruptcy Examiner. <clears throat> but again, there is very detailed information day by day about how much cash Lehman was losing, um, about how much cash it had left. Uh, there were various analyses inside Lehman, outside Lehman, of what was going to happen in the week of September 15th and the weeks thereafter if Lehman had stayed in business. So it's possible to make, you know, not a, we, we don't know exactly, but it's, it's possible to be pretty uh, confident in making an estimate of how much cash Lehman would have needed to borrow uh, in order to stay in operation. And the bottom line number I come up with is $84 billion. Uh, it's actually quite straightforward to figure out how much collateral Lehman had available. Um, one can look at Lehman's balance sheet and its financial records and look at what assets it had which were not otherwise encumbered. And when you add that up, uh, they had $114 billion of assets 
which were eligible collateral under the rules of the primary dealer credit facility. So again, the, the PDCF was set up for just this kind of circumstance uh, to lend money uh, to investment banks that, that uh, ran out of cash. <clears throat> and even if you put haircuts on the collateral, um, so you lend less than $114 billion, there was plenty of collateral to borrow the $84 billion that Lehman needed to stay in business. <clears throat> now again, uh, these numbers, I realize, are coming out of thin air, and one would have to read a fair amount of the book and look at the primary evidence to decide whether you really believe me or not. Um, but let me give w one piece of intuition for why this number should make sense. And um, uh, that's the following. <clears throat> Lehman uh, lost cash for a number of reasons. Uh, counterparties demanded more collateral. Customers withdrew some funds. The primary reason, though, that they lost cash was that counterparties refused uh, to roll over repurchase agreements or, or repos. So the short-term borrowing that Lehman did was in the form of repurchase agreements. Some of you know what those are. The key point is that repurchase agreements are collateralized loans. Um, so when Fidelity Mutual Funds said, we're no longer going to lend you cash, we're cutting off our repo line, that meant that, that the collateral that Lehman uh, had, had posted to Fidelity Mutual Funds was returned to Lehman because Fidelity was cutting off the repos. And with the PDCF in existence, uh, the loss of repo financing should have been an easy problem to solve because if Fidelity Funds would no longer take the collateral from Lehman and provide cash to Lehman, uh, Lehman could turn to the Fed's PDCF and provide the collateral and the PDCF could have provided the cash. Um, so, uh, so, so again, that explains about $66 billion of the 84 they needed to borrow uh, was to replace repurchase agreements that didn't roll over. And that's some intuition about why that should not have been a diff difficult problem to solve. <clears throat> okay. Now again, another important point is that the Fed's role in Lehman Brothers was not a passive one. It was not just that Lehman Brothers was over here failing and the Fed stayed over here and said, it's none of our business, we're not going to intervene. Um, the Fed actually took action. So um, Fed and Treasury officials were very involved in brokering uh, the Barclays acquisition that almost happened. Um, uh, but once the Barclays uh, acquisition fell through on September 14th, uh, Fed and Treasury officials decided, well, the backup plan has to be bankruptcy. So um, there was a meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York at which uh, Lehman's lawyers and executives were called down to the New York Fed, and uh, the general counsel, the head lawyer for the New York Fed, said, uh, we've decided uh, that you have to declare bankruptcy. So, so the New York Fed ordered Lehman to file a bankruptcy petition. Now, the story is a little bit more complex than that because, there, because under U.S. law, uh, the Federal Reserve does not have the legal authority to order a private corporation to file a bankruptcy petition. So uh, the Fed had to back up uh, their order to file a bankruptcy petition with actions to make sure uh, that Lehman did not have any good alternative to bankruptcy. Uh, and here's what they did. And actually that story may be of special interest here uh, because the key things that happened uh, happened in London. Oops. Uh-oh. Okay. All right, so again, this is a little bit complex. Uh, so everybody knows that Lehman failed bank filed a bankruptcy petition. What entity exactly was it that filed this famous bankruptcy petition? It was filed by something called Lehman Brothers Holding Incorporated, LBHI, which, as the name suggests, was a holding company which had lots of subsidiaries. When the holding company filed for bankruptcy, most of the subsidiaries also filed for bankruptcy uh, of, of various types under legal regimes in various countries where they operated. There was one subsidiary of LBHI 
which did not file a bankruptcy petition on September 15th. And that was Lehman's broker dealer in New York, the name of which uh, was Lehman Brothers Incorporated, or LBI. Uh, the Fed didn't want LBI to cease operations immediately uh, because they thought it would be better for, they, they thought that LBI should go out of business, but they thought it would be better if LBI were allowed to wind down its operations somewhat slowly so that customers had time to move elsewhere so they could close out contracts and so on. Um, so the Fed actually said, uh, we're going to provide support uh, to keep LBI in operation. It was for a period of up to two weeks. So it's actually a little bit ironic that it, on, on September 15th, when the headlines were saying Fed draws a line in the, sta in the sand, no bailout for Lehman, they were actually lending $28 billion to one part of Lehman that they wanted to keep going. All right, now Lehman had very similar broker dealers in New York and in London. Uh, the one in London uh, was called Lehman Brothers Incorporated uh, Europe, LBIE. And uh, Lehman as a whole said, well, that's great that you're lending cash to LBI. Uh, we also have a run at LBIE. How about you lend some cash to them as well, and then they can both keep operating and the whole business uh, doesn't have to go under. And uh, the Fed said no. The Fed said we will lend to the New York broker dealer. We will not lend to the London broker dealer. Um, at that point, uh, Lehman, and again, this is very well documented in memos and, and other documents from the time, uh, Lehman executives had a plan at which, in, in which, okay, if only LBI can borrow, not the rest of Lehman, uh, that's okay because uh, LBI, so, uh, LBHI was a very well-integrated uh, operation where the different subsidiaries constantly were sending different assets and cash back and forth. So the plan as of Sunday afternoon, September 14th, was um, different units of Lehman will send their assets to LBI. LBI will take those assets to, to the Fed's primary dealer credit facility and pledge all those assets and borrow enough money so that could, could, could distribute funds throughout the Lehman enterprise, including to Lehman's broker dealer in London, and then everybody would have enough cash to keep operating. Um, but uh, uh, the Fed made a special rule uh, forbidding that. In, in the literature on the Lehman failure, uh, the rule the Fed imposed is called the, the Friday criterion. Uh, because it said uh, that LBI could borrow money, but the only assets it could use as collateral were assets that were on its balance sheet on Friday, September 12th. And that thwarted uh, the attempt of Lehman over the weekend to transfer assets to LBI uh, so they could borrow more. Um, now, uh, the Fed's treatment of the London broker-dealer of Lehman was very, very inconsistent with its treatment of other firms. So a week later, uh, all, a very similar story played out um, at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Um, uh, once Lehman failed, people started wondering what's going to happen to Goldman and Morgan Stanley. They started running out of cash. <clears throat> On the evening of Sunday, September 21st, uh, the Fed stepped in and uh, actually all through the week of September 15th, the Fed had been lending a lot of money to the New York broker dealers of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. But on Sunday, September 21st, the Fed said, oh my goodness, uh, there's a run on the London broker dealers of Goldman and Morgan Stanley, so let's start lending to them as well. So uh, one way to look at the whole thing is that if on September 14th, uh, the Fed had done for Lehman uh, what it did on September 21st for Goldman and Morgan Stanley, extending PDCF access to the London broker-dealers, that would have been sufficient to keep Lehman in operation uh, for some time. All right, so um, putting, that, putting that all together, uh, the Fed could have rescued Lehman Brothers. The Fed actually lent part of Lehman Brothers $28 billion. $28 billion was not enough cash for Lehman to stay in operation. $84 billion would have been enough, or approximately would have been enough cash 
for, the, for all of Lehman uh, to stay in operation and to avoid the ludicrously uh, abrupt uh, bankruptcy filing. Um, all right, now, of course, in the alternative history in which uh, the Fed kept Lehman going for some time period, uh, we don't know what exactly the outcome would have been for Lehman. And uh, we'll never know, and I think there are several possible things that could have happened. One is that the Barclays deal might have finally gone through. Um, again, the details are complex, and we can discuss them, but it is possible that with a period of weeks and months, negotiations could have, been, could have proceeded, and uh, Lehman and Barclays could have made adjustments in their deal, which would have, would have made it acceptable to the, to the UK Financial Services Authority, and, and, then we, and, and then all of Lehman would have been a subsidiary of um, Barclays, uh, instead of just the New York broker-dealer. I think that was on an, an earlier slide, that what actually happened to LBI, the Lehman broker-dealer, is that after the holding company declared bankruptcy, uh, Barclays came back three days later and said uh, to the bankruptcy estate, let us buy your New York uh, broker-dealer. Um, uh, but uh, with enough time, uh, the deal for Barclays to purchase all of Lehman and to avoid the bankruptcy filing uh, might have been, um, uh, might have happened. Perhaps the Barclay deal would not have happened in the end. Uh, we'll never know. I think there's also a pretty good chance, and I discuss the arguments back and forth in the book, uh, that Lehman, like AIG, like a number of firms, could have taken actions and restructured itself so that along with Fed, Federal Reserve assistance uh, to, have, to get cash during its crisis, it could have been viable in the long run. And you know, we might have a healthy Lehman Brothers Holding Incorporated operating around the world today. Uh, we don't know. In the worst case, uh, maybe Lehman's problems really did not have a long-term solution. Maybe eventually Lehman would have gone bankrupt. There still would have been a world of difference between an orderly unwind in which, again, customers in New York, customers in London had time to move their accounts elsewhere. Uh, the, the New York unit, the London unit had time uh, to close out derivatives contracts and so on. Um, and again, this is discussed in the book. Uh, there could have been a more orderly bankruptcy process, uh, which probably would have been much less disruptive to the financial system and um, much less costly to the global economy. Um, okay. I think about five more minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Um, all right, so let's go back now and um, look at what policymakers have said uh, about why they were not rescuing Lehman. Uh, and again, we unfortunately have to make a very clear distinction between what policymakers said and did in real time during the crisis and what policymakers have been saying after the crisis through today uh, in a retrospective attempt to justify uh, their actions. So again, this is heavily documented uh, in memos and emails between different people the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. There was a lot of discussion about ways in which um, the New York Fed could have provided cash for Lehman. There were discussions, should we do this through the primary dealer credit facility? Should we create some different facility? What are the different strategies for rescuing Lehman? Um, that discussion contained almost no reference to how much collateral Lehman had. Uh, it included no reference, nobody ever raised the question of is this legal or not? Again, that was an idea raised after the fact. Um, what were people talking about where there were, there were a lot of political discussions. So uh, Henry, Treasury Secretary, so, so, so one important fact is that the decision that Lehman has to fail, we're gonna order them to go bankrupt and then do things to make sure they have no alternative. That decision was made primarily by uh, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson. Um, now under the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the Treasury Secretary, under the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, has the authority to decide who to lend to. If it had wanted to, the New York Fed could have requested 
uh, permission to lend to Lehman uh, from uh, the Board of Governors, and the Board of Governors could have given permission. The legal role of the Treasury Secretary at the time in deciding uh, whether uh, Lehman should receive a Fed loan, that role legally was the same as the role of the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of Agriculture or the Mayor of London. Uh, uh, there was no legal role uh, whatsoever. Nonetheless, the way it played out was that Henry Paulson arrived at the New York Fed uh, the weekend before the bankruptcy, started telling Timothy Geithner, the president of the New York Fed, what to do, and his orders were followed. And it's clear that politi politics were foremost in Henry Paulson's mind. He's quoted by many people as saying, um, uh, I can't be Mr. Bailout. Uh, he was stung by the criticism of the Bear Stearns rescue and the takeover of, uh, takeovers of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, he said, uh, I can't do it again. I can't be Mr. Bailout. Um, uh, Secretary Paulson's uh, chief of staff sent an email uh, to his press secretary, which is short uh, but to the point, uh, saying we can't bail out Lehman because it will look awful in the press. That was, I think, the, the number one factor. Um, I, in addition, uh, it's clear that neither um, Paulson nor Fed officials fully anticipated how much damage the Lehman bankruptcy would do. Again, today they said, we knew it would be a catastrophe. We wish we could have saved it. It wasn't legally possible. But again, that does not fit the real-time record. Just by coincidence, one of the regularly scheduled meetings of the Federal Open Market Committee that happens every six weeks occurred on the morning of Tuesday, September 16th, in the very brief period between the Lehman bankruptcy filing and, uh, AI and the AIG rescue. And um, you can read the transcript of that meeting, and it was absolutely not the case that anybody thought that a catastrophe had just occurred. There was some discussion of strains and financial markets have increased. We certainly have to look at this very carefully, but most of the FOMC meeting was a very normal FOMC meeting where they talked about there are upside risks to inflation, there are downside risks to growth, on balance, the, the risks are even, so let's not change the federal funds rate. There was absolutely nobody saying uh, we've, we've just had a catastrophe. Um, all right, now, since the bankruptcy, um, again, Bernanke, Geithner, and others have, have given this story about lack of collateral. But although they've said this again and again and again and again, they've never really given good reasons for why anybody should believe it. Um, now, the, the one time, usually when Bernanke and Geithner have, have, have spoken, it's been in forums in which questions are not taken or they have friendly audiences and they're not cross-examined very rigorously on their story. The one time when uh, Fed officials, two of them, uh, one was Ben Bernanke, the other was Thomas Baxter, uh, the general counsel for the New York Fed, uh, the, the, the one time those officials were questioned in a somewhat hostile way was at a public uh, hearing of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, where Bernanke and Thomas Baxter, the general counsel, testified under oath, and where the commissioners of the FCIC were fairly tough. So Bernanke and Baxter said, so, so they, they were asked, why didn't you rescue Lehman? Well, Bernanke said they didn't have enough collateral. So the question is, how do you know they didn't have enough collateral? Well, the New York Fed told me they didn't have enough collateral. Well, how did the New York Fed know they didn't have enough collateral? Where is the evidence? And again, you can look this very up very easily on the website of the FCIC. There's a long circular discussion in which the question is asked and not answered of, of how do you know there wasn't enough collateral. Um, the FCIC was not satisfied fully with Bernanke's testimony. So they sent him a follow-up letter asking a number of questions, and here's one of them. It's a rather long question involving, you stated the New York Fed did an analysis of collateral, provide this collateral analysis, tell us the name of the person who gave it to you, or the time, location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The way I interpret this question is that the FCIC is saying, we really, really, really want you to tell us about this collateral analysis that we're asking about. Uh, in response, so the FCIC sent six questions. This was one of them. In response to the six questions, Bernanke sent 
uh, 15 pages of small single space type, you can look through those 16 pages and uh, there was one passage that is responsive to the FCIC's question. That passage consists of one sentence. That one sentence is, this information was conveyed to me by phone that weekend by uh, New York Fed officials. So I'll, I'll let that speak to itself as far as, speak for itself as far as uh, how well uh, Bernanke and others have been able to back up their claims about collateral. Okay, two more slides very briefly. Um, I, I, again, when pressed by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, uh, Bernanke and Thomas Baxter, the New York Fed lawyer, have said a number of things uh, that don't really make sense. So uh, one thing they've said is uh, that Lehman was insolvent. And they were deeply insolvent. And because of that, they weren't going to be viable in the long term. So since they were going to fail anyway, what was the point of using Federal Reserve funds to try to keep them going? Um, the trouble is, in explaining why Lehman was insolvent, uh, Thomas Baxter, the New York Fed's lawyer, uh, confused the concepts of insolvency and illiquidity uh, in a way that I hope LSE faculty would grade quite harshly if they saw it on an undergraduate exam. Uh, so uh, one of the commissioners said, well, Lehman says they're solvent. How do you, why do you think they weren't solvent? And uh, Baxter says, well, one definition of insolvent is you can't pay your bills as they come due. Uh, nobody would extend credit to Lehman. In economics, we usually call the situation that's being described there uh, liquidity. And we would say Lehman had a liquidity crisis, which is a di different thing from insolvency. Leaving aside terminology, um, under the Federal Reserve Act, one criterion that for the Fed being allowed to make a loan to an investment bank um, is, and, and the, the legislation says, it has to be the case that the investment bank is unable to secure credit from another banking institution. So Baxter in this testimony is citing the fact that Lehman satisfied one of the criteria that would allow the Fed to lend to them that they couldn't get credit anywhere else, and he is using that as a reason why the Fed could not lend. So that just doesn't, doesn't make any sense, uh, plain and simple. Uh, and, and the last example, um, um, again, uh, Baxter, and in this case, uh, Ben Bernanke, also stressed the idea that uh, Lehman was insolvent, uh, Lehman was a mess, uh, Lehman couldn't survive. And in trying to support that position, they said everybody knew that. The markets knew that. We knew that. Even the people at Lehman Brothers knew that. Um, so if the situation was hopeless, you know, why throw money at it? In making that argument, they badly take out of context. Uh, so they cite the, the minutes of the board of directors meeting at Lehman on September 14th, where the decision was made to declare bankruptcy. And they quote a couple statements about the uh, uh, Lehman executives and lawyers saying it was likely we'll have to file a bankruptcy petition. Bankruptcy was an ultimate inevitability. And so Baxter and Bernanke say, uh, well, Lehman knew it was hopeless. Bankruptcy was inevitable, so there was no point in lending the money. Again, that's badly taken out of context. If you read uh, the minutes for yourself, which again you can do on the user-friendly website of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, it's crystal clear that what Lehman's executives and lawyers were saying is that it's inevitable that we're going to have to file a bankruptcy petition tomorrow morning because the Federal Reserve has refused to assist us. Uh, so the fact that they had that viewpoint isn't a good reason for the Federal Reserve not to assist them. And with that, I will just stop and I would love to, to, to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Larry, for that very stimulating um, talk. We're gonna go and take some questions now. I will, add, I will collect two, three or four each round. I hope we'll do three rounds, maybe only two. Um, so please put your hand up if you wanna ask a question. I'll call on you. Um, a few things, first, when you ask your question, please just state your name and your affiliation. It helps the speaker understand a little bit the context. And try to keep it short so that I can do three rounds if possible. So I'll start with the gentleman over here, thank you. Oh, and there's microphones coming around, so please wait for the microphone. Otherwise, people will have trouble hearing it. 
Hello, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was uh, extremely interesting and I really admire your research and all the details you cited. I'm Jonathan Old uh, from the uh, two-year MSc program here at LSE. And I would like to ask if you confronted uh, the people at Fed, like Ben, ben Bernanke or Timothy Geithner, with, with your research findings or if you, you personally got any reactions from them and if you believe that your research will contribute to, to well, correcting the official narrative of, of the financial crisis. Thank you. Over there. Yes. Um, Judith Shapiro, Economics, LSE. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this absolutely brilliant and devastating legal case. I don't think that there's probably anybody in the audience what we'll hear from them who hasn't uh, understood that. And I think it fits a lot of those who watched in that, uh, that long London night until dawn uh, on the night of the 14th to 15th, still felt whether it was legal or not, it was crazy what they were doing. Um, so I wanted just to ask you a question on taking it in the future a step further, and you were thinking on that, which is that why we are all here and riveted is not just one firm, but the sense that if only this not ha had not happened, it would not be so big. Uh, and to me, what's also important is not just our colleagues and well-trained people who should have known better, but people I don't expect anything better from, the House of Representatives of the United States. <laughs> and they also then dithered. So I think it would be, I don't know if you agree with this, but a very important uh, additional macroeconomic history to then try to figure out how we can say things about the counterfactual in which this didn't happen or in which what, as my memory tells me, um, the TARP, the, the bailout, uh, there was dithering. A Paulson, ironically, apparently got down in his hands and knees or, and, and begged Nancy Pelosi and so on. So what do we do to show how important this mistake was? Thank you. Martin Zandby from the Financial Times. Uh, thanks. That was fascinating. Uh, so I'd love to hear more, in particular, about how you know that the collateral was so good. Uh, that's sort of a general question. You know, how have you found this out, uh, in particular, in ways that they could have known at the time? And maybe you could make some reference to the, uh, uh, the 105 repo accounting issue. Just a very specific kind of implication of that question, which relates to the previous question. If it's the case that there was ample collateral, you know, far in excess of the uh, refinancing needed, uh, then when the bankruptcy happens, in bankruptcies, secured, secured creditors get their collateral, which, on your view, was more than enough to cover these debts. If that's true, why was the bankruptcy so catastrophic? One more now. Well, well, actually, can you just repeat the last part again? If the collateral was so valuable, why was it so? Ca why why did the bankruptcy have such catastrophic effects? Given that the creditors immediately got their money's worth and more, presumably, because that's how bank. There might might be something with the timing and so on. But please explain how those are not. Uh, it seems to me that there's an inconsistency there. If the collateral was that good, why was the bankruptcy such a big deal? Gentleman here on the second row. Yes, right there. Excellent. Thank you. Of course, you're next. Thanks. Uh, Richard Portis, London Business School. Um, one very precise question, and that is the bankruptcy filing. Did that show positive net worth or not? Uh, a second, much broader question is at the Brookings conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was there any, I mean, your book's been out for a while now, the NBER long working paper has been out a very long time. Um, did anyone challenge uh, the triumvirate uh, on uh, the, their story based on your, with, with a basis in your book? And finally, a very quick anecdote. We had a similar legal argument here uh, regarding Northern Rock. The then governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, said, I can't do what I, what Eddie George could have done. 
um, uh, because uh, my lawyers tell me there's a European <coughs> Union law that now, new law that prevents me from doing it. Um, and my response to that was, I knew Eddie George. If anybody had told Eddie George that, he would have said, get out of my office. I don't want to hear that. Um, I'll go ahead and do what I have to do. And if they want to sue me, they can sue me in five years ahead. We'll see each other in court. So Larry, you can answer this first one. Uh, uh, okay, uh, very good question. Some easier to answer than others. Um, so, so somebody mentioned the Brookings Conference and on whether I've confronted Fed officials. It crossed my mind to you know, go down and storm into the Brookings Institution, uh, but that's, that's just not my, you know, M Michael Moore would have done that maybe. That's not my, <laughs> not my personality type. Um, I, I, it's, I believe that nobody mentioned my book at that conference. And I, I have gotten no reaction from, I, I, I've talked to lower, some lower level people at the Fed who I know, and they say my book is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> uh, as, as far as I know, uh, uh, Bernanke, Geithner, and, and so on, I presume they've heard of it. They ha have not made any comment on it. Um, and as far as whether I'll be successful in changing the narrative, you know, that is the, the big question for me. I, and I, I honestly don't know. It, it, uh, I'm hoping that events like this will help spread the word, but uh, it, it remains to be seen. Um, I, you know, and again, it is a little frustrating to me that um, because Bernanke, Geithner, and Paulson are, you know, in many ways justifiably well-regarded, distinguished people, and because they say so often and so clearly and so emphatically, we did not have legal authority, we've already told you we did not have legal authority, a lot of people figure, well, they must, it must be true, but it's just saying it lots of times doesn't make it true. All right. Um, <clears throat> So briefly, the counterfactual, if I understood the question, um, again, it's anybody's guess. A lot of the things that happened in the fall of 2008 followed directly from the Lehman failure. The run on the money market funds that was very disruptive in the US happened because one money market fund held Lehman commercial paper that defaulted. You generally, I think the panic. So I, I think actually um, there, uh, there would have been a lot less uh, chaos if Lehman had been rescued. Pro you know, quite possibly, some of the other things like the TARP would not have been as necessary uh, uh, if Lehman had been rescued. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the opposition to it. I mean, I, I think underlying it all is, is a widespread. I, I don't like the term bailout. It's pejorative. I, I would like to use the term short-term, well-collateralized loan or liquidity assistance. But people are, I actually, this is a bit, I, I, I was very happy. I published an op-ed in, in The Guardian, and I looked it up, and oh, 150 comments, that's great. I bet people really learned a lot from my nuanced uh, discussion. <laughs> and it was, you know, one person after another, you know, I can't believe those crooks on Wall Street weren't locked up, you know. <laughs> and uh, so that's, the, you know, that's the popular. Um, all right, a couple other. Um, how do we know about the collateral values? So. Um, Lehman was famous for having assets that uh, were probably overvalued. Actually, to slip in an answer to the previous question, in its, one, in its bankruptcy filing, Lehman said it had $28 billion of net worth. It's generally believed they overstated some of their assets. Probably their net worth was pretty close to zero. Um, but, uh, so not that they were in one, but, but they, they had plenty of collateral to keep going for a while. Um, <clears throat> the, Assets that, used as, that, that were used as collateral to PDCF were not these very illiquid assets. They were, those were things like private equity investments, real estate development projects. <clears throat> the collateral in question were securities, uh, which generally had some fairly well agreed upon price, which other investment banks used both before and after, you know, a variety of equities, uh, corporate bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, where there was a fairly well-established valuation, and they were used as collateral before and after uh, the Lehman bankruptcy by other firms. They were used as collateral by LBI. So, so basically, taking the same kind of collateral valued in the same way as was done for other institutions and even for part of Lehman uh, would have been enough. Repo 105, uh, I'm not sure, um, 
So Repro 105 was an accounting trick which made it look as though Lehman's leverage ratio was not as high as it was. And I have a lengthy footnote about this in the book. Even if you undo Repro 105, which means uh, realizing that Lehman had more treasury securities than it said, and on the other side of the balance sheet had more uh, treasury repos than it said, that doesn't materially affect any of my calculations. It might have mattered for some reasons. Um, but, um, all right, try to, um, so actually maybe that, um, I think that covers most of the questions. I have a gentleman over there in the back. Hi, um, I'm Perry. I study in Master in Economics here. So when I, before I came to this um, seminar, I actually did some background reading, and I found out that um, on September 27, 2008, Nomura Holding actually paid only two U.S. dollar to acquire the European and Middle East operation uh, investment banking operation of Lehman Brothers. So does this two dollars like arbitrary small amount? Um, reflects that the Lehman situation were actually way worse than like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley back in 2008. So is that uh, one of the reasons why um, the Fed um, feels like it's too risky to save Lehman's brother compared to other investment banks? Thank you. Gentlemen, all the way at the front, top. Hi, um, my name is Aditya. I'm a first year undergrad. I just started a week ago in the math department. Um, I want to thank you for the very stimulating talk. Um, my question was, do you think the 2008 financial crisis was in favor of free markets, or do you think it was in favor of government, of, of, heavier, go of heavier government regulations? And now, gentleman over here, let's get in the mic. Um, good evening, Professor. Thank you for the talk. It was very insightful. Uh, uh, my name is Ruven. I'm doing BSc in economics in the first year. So I'm assuming that uh, Bernanke and um, Baxter, they knew what they were going in for, and they knew that possibly trying to hide the situation wouldn't do them any good. I'm assuming that. So why do it in the first place? What did they get out of lying their way through this whole situation? And I'll find there's a lady there in the back that by the door, and then hopefully we'll have another round because there's a few more hands up. Um. Well, thank you for your talk, and, um, and I'll a first year LSE student doing mathematics. Um, I wonder um, the reason of not bailing out a Lehman brother is not lack of uh, collateral or um, lack of authority, then what is the real reason of not bailing out? And why it is Lehman brother that is not bailing out uh, rather than other um, institutions in big five? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so the question about Nomura buying uh, a large part of Lehman for $2 actually reminds me of another question I didn't answer before, which is if, if, if they were in okay uh, financial shape before the bankruptcy, why were there such losses uh, during the bankruptcy? And part, part of the answer to that is that when they went bankrupt, th there was pressure for them to sell off assets very quickly. So there were essentially fire sales in which they sold large parts of their operations and many of their assets for below uh, reasonable prices. Um, that was true also. Uh, so Robert Diamond, um, the uh, head of Barclays at the time, made it clear uh, uh, leading up to the crisis, uh, he was asked by Henry Paulson, hey, how about you buy Lehman or part of Lehman? And he said, well, I might be interested assuming I buy it at a very, very distressed price. Uh, and, and, and that's what happened. So the, the estate lost a lot of money by selling off assets at fire sale prices. That meant Le Lehman did have a large amount of unsecured debt, um, and the unsecured debt holders are uh, losing quite a bit of money. Um, uh, why do they do this? What were the real reasons? Why was it Lehman? So, so th the real reason was, first and foremost, political pressure. The question, well, why did political pressure lead them to let Lehman fail, whereas they rescued the others? Again, this is somewhat speculative, but, but I think 
the fatal problem for Lehman was that they were exactly number two in the line of investment banks to get in trouble. Uh, why is that? The first one was Bear Stearns. When Bear Stearns got in trouble, the immediate reaction of policymakers is, we can't let a huge investment bank suddenly go bankrupt. We have to intervene and rescue them. So, so they did. After Bear Stearns, that was when there was tremendous political backlash. And uh, on the eve of the Lehman failure, they knew that if we now rescue another investment bank, the backlash will be in even an order of magnitude bigger than um, uh, that for Bear Stearns. So basically, the political pushback against the Bear Stearns rescue made them say, we're not going to rescue Lehman. After that, uh, it took them uh, about 36 hours to realize that uh, the US and possibly the world were heading for something similar to, or who knows, worse than the 1930s, that the financial system was melting down. And uh, Henry Paulson decided being Mr. Bailout wasn't such a great legacy, but being Mr. Let a Depression ha happen that was worse than the 1930s would also be not so great. So he made a 180 degree turn very quickly, and AIG was rescued, everybody, everybody else was rescued. Um, so it was where Lehman was in line. Um, oh, and I only have the same question about free market and regulations. Uh, so Barney Frank, who the Dodd-Frank bill is named after, uh, made a, you know, a wisecrack remark that he thinks that September 15th uh, should be a national holiday in the United States uh, called Free Market Day. Uh, <laughs> because on September 15th, the Fed decided to let markets work and uh, let Lehman fail, and then the next day they said, oh, we, we were just kidding, and they uh, re rescued AIG and everybody else. Um. Good. So we'll do one very quick last round. You here has been waiting for a while, and there was someone up there. Yes. First of all, thank you for your insightful and, and thoughtful lecture. Uh, I'm studying at University College London Information Management for Business. And my question is quite simple. What are your thoughts on a decentralized economy given all of this happening? And thank you. Yeah, good evening. Um, my name is Simon. I'm a general course student at LSE. Um, yeah, you mentioned, I'm up here, sorry. Up here. Left, left. <laughs> okay, thank you. Up yeah, left. you mentioned the <laughs> crucial role Hank Paulson played in September 2008. Do you think his kind of special relationship to Goldman Sachs mattered in this context? Okay, and then finally, this gentleman over here was, had his hand up from the start. <laughs> so we'll stop there. Hi there, Fred Coltman, uh, uh, MSc Economic History Research. I'm just sort of wondering, because you mentioned AIG and Bear Stearns, first of all, was in the six month period between those two, was there anything that maybe by going over Bear Stearns' books, the Treasury learned that could have put up red flags when going over Lehman's? And second of all, you mentioned AIG. Surely the AIG's role as almost like the underwriter of the financial world was far more significant than Lehman Brothers, which was just another investment bank. Thank you. Uh, okay, so if, if I understood the first question, it was what does this say about decentralized markets or maybe what does this say about capitalism? And uh, that's a, a big question. I think in, you know, in a market economy, we have financial markets, and despite regulators' best efforts, you know, uh, there are periodically going to be problems and crises. And you know, for me, the big policy takeaway is that uh, in the economic system we uh, have, uh, it's very important for central banks to do what Walter Badgett said in the 19th century in talking about the Bank of England, that a central bank has to be the lender of last resort and has to be the one to step in with emergency loans uh, in this kind of crisis. Uh, oh, so Henry Paulson and Goldman Sachs. So a lot of people have made a big point about this. So Henry Paulson had been the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers were competitors. Um, uh, I, I've never read, I, I've, I've never met Henry Paulson or Richard Fauld. I have read in many places that they didn't like each other, that there was a personal rivalry. And, and peop some people have, have given, you know, rather exaggerated stories about 
know, Henry Paulson was really happy that he could, you know, see his rival, Dick Fauld, uh, go down in flames. Th you know, that I think is very exaggerated. Again, there's, there's lots of evidence on what policymakers were thinking and doing, and Henry Paulson was not a happy person. I mean, he, he realized that at best, this was going to be a big risk. He, he, as he says, he worked night and day as hard as he could to arrange the Barclays takeover. He did everything he could to rescue Lehman short of uh, allowing the Fed to um, make a loan. I do think um, the Paulson-Fold relationship or the, or the Paulson-Goldman thing might have mattered in a somewhat more subtle way. So sometime, I think on September 14th, Richard Fold uh, reached Henry Paulson on the phone after a number of attempts. Uh, and again, according to things I've read, you know, made a plea, uh, uh, Hank, you don't know what's, what's happening. This is terrible. You've got to do something. And, and Paulson brushed him off. He said, oh, Dick, I'm so sorry. There's nothing we can do. Uh, he obviously didn't, didn't take it very seriously. So I imagine a hypothetical situation in which Paulson had received a phone call from Lloyd Blankfein, uh, the current CEO of Goldman Sachs, his longtime colleague for whom he had tremendous esteem. Lloyd Blankfein had said, Hank, you don't know what's happening. You've got to do something. Maybe Paulson would have at least stopped to think for a minute. Uh, boy, Lloyd Blankfein is saying this is a disaster. Whether it would have changed his decision, I don't know. Um, what did the Fed learn from Bear Stearns? I think the Fed learned from Bear Stearns that something similar might happen. And actually, in the six months, Lehman also learned something. So as I discussed in my book, in the six months between um, the Bear crisis and the Lehman crisis, uh, Lehman tried very hard to undo some of the problems it had. It tried very hard to sell its illiquid assets. Unfortunately, by definition, illiquid assets are difficult to sell, so they made some progress, but only limited progress before uh, time ran out. And, and they, were incur they were strongly encouraged by uh, regulators to uh, sell illiquid assets, build up liquidity, but they just weren't able to do enough. Um, I, I think somebody, somebody said AIG was more important than Lehman, and I think that's actually probably, or that's probably true, that however bad the recession was because of Lehman's failure, and again, I think who got rescued uh, depended on the place in line. I think possibly if uh, Goldman Sachs had gotten, I mean, if, if uh, it had been AIG with a crisis on September 15th, and Lehman on September 16th, instead of vice versa, that AIG would have failed, Lehman would have been rescued, and, and possibly that actually would have been, so in a sense, it was lucky that number two, the one that was allowed to fail, was not as huge as, uh, say, AIG, and, uh, or that it wasn't Citigroup, which was even huger, uh, or, or things could have been you know, even uh, a large degree worse than they were, which was certainly pretty terrible. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Larry. A round of applause. And thank you so much.